the LAII and UNMP Studies have um, co-sponsored and also the Student Organization for Latin American Studies. Um, and we're proud to welcome Ana Rivera. She's the leader from the Honduran Resistance Movement. And um, Ana is on a speaking tour with Witness for Peace Southwest uh, and the Honduras Solidarity Network. And um, special thanks to Tanya Cole for helping us organize her trip here. Um, Tanya's from Witness for Peace, and she's at that table if you have any questions afterwards. Um, Ana Rivera is 25 years old, and she comes from Honduras' capital of Tegucigalpa. Um, she graduated from the Universidad Católica de Honduras with a degree in environmental engineering. And since the coup d'etat that ousted the democratically elected president, Manuel Zelaya, in 2009, Ana has been actively involved in the resistance movement that arose in opposition to the coup regime. Ana is a leader in the political organization Los Necios, and she is a coordinator of the feminist Marxist collective called Las Necias. Additionally, she is a member of the political commission for the Libre Party, which is the political party that is affiliated with the Honduran resistance. Um, and we are welcoming Ana at a crucial time for Honduras. Um, the elections are coming up November 24th in Honduras. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ana Vera. Thank you all for coming and thanks to LAII for inviting me and uh, opening their doors uh, so I can speak a little bit of what is the situation in Honduras today and uh, a little bit of what happened in 2009 during the coup. So uh, my presentation is called Honduras from Resistance to Power because uh, uh, after the resistance movement formed, also a political party formed with the people that have organized in our country. So just uh, to locate Honduras is, uh, this is near Nicaragua, in between Nicaragua and Guatemala, and we're also partners with El Salvador. So Honduras today is uh, the country with more violent murders uh, per each 100,000 people. We have 86 murders per 100,000 people. And just to compare to Nicaragua, which is our partner, they just have 12 murders per 100,000 people. These murders are uh, based on many reasons. Most of them because of the supposed drug war in our country. Also because we have many politically targeted murders in Honduras. Uh, just after the resistance movement created, 200 people died in the streets during the march. Also, we have around more than 100 campesinos that have, peasants campesinos that have been killed for defending their land in Honduras. We've had journalists and also lawyers who have been speaking the truth out of what happened in Honduras, also killed and murdered. Honduras is also the second most poor country in the American country, only after Haiti. 70% of Honduran people live under the line of uh, poverty, and 60% of them under, under extreme poverty. Also, only 5% of all murders get to trial. This is very important because after the coup, the coup was basically a strike to our constitution. It was an abuse of power from the oligarchy, from the conservative parties in Honduras, and also supported by the Catholic Church in our country. This led open the doors to impunity in our country. And uh, we've ha we have now murders uh, that we have no idea why they are committed and no criminal investigation. And these 5% that do get it is because maybe there are people that have money and can pay lawyers and can pay for criminal investigation. And the, also one of our very, very bad situations in Honduras is the women's situation. Uh, we have a, every 15 hours a woman is killed in Honduras. So. For women, it's, it is also a very violent situation, not just because of what I mentioned before, but also a sexual violence and domestic violence. 
So in 2009, as I was saying, President Zelaya is removed from its charge by the military forces supported by the U.S. Embassy. As I was saying, this is a very important event to Honduras because it, it has created two two situations that we had never lived before in our country. The first one is the violence after the coup, and the second one is the organization that happened after the coup. People organized in the, in the popular resistance, La Resistencia Popular, becoming the strongest political movement in the history of Honduras. This is a specific movement that took place in, in the streets half a year for half a year after it, uh, the coup happened, but it was attacked by military and police forces. And uh, as I was saying, for in these four years, more than 200 people have been killed in the streets. So what happened is that the resistance movement is conformed by many of their organizations that existed before the coup. We had unions, we had teachers' organizations, we had many also LGTBI organizations, feminist organizations, but they were all scattered. They were all fighting for their own uh, interests. And what happened after the coup is that it united all of the forces of all the social movements in Honduras into one uh, purpose. We, in the streets, we met each other and we realize that our enemy is just one and that is how we all organize in the big movement that is now the Resistencia, the National Front of People Resistance. This had never been lived in Honduras before. We had never such, had such a big movement in our country. Yes. <laughs> so, in a, what happened after is that well, the United States supported the coup. It said that it was not a military coup. It said that it was not a strike to our constitution and that it was legal to remove President Zelaya from its charge. And uh, so after, Porfirio Lobo was elected as president and Juan Orlando Hernandez was named president of the Congress. These are the people that are right now in power and in, in control of our country. Many of the people behind the coup were rewarded with high positions in the new government. So we can see how this also uh, affected and uh, became uh, grateful for the oligarchy in Honduras, which are also part of the people who control our country. Basically 12 families that own most of the land in our country. So this is a video. Um, uh, uh, get it started. It shows a little bit of uh, the repression that happened um, what, in, the days, uh, from? in the days uh, from the coup. Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in the uh, movies in there, you just push it away. But <laughs> is there probably a button? Well, what's this broadcasting going to be? Tell us, sir, who are they? Probably enter? This yeah, is Telesur. Yeah, who are they? Telesur is one of the biggest uh, media from uh, uh, the south, uh, based in Venezuela. They, they pass like the most important news happening all throughout Latin America and also uh, Eastern countries. So they are very important to us. There it is. Mm -hmm. La marcha de decenas de maestros, doctores sociales y niños con un hijo de represión por parte de los funcionarios de la seguridad nacional. Hasta el momento, el gobierno ha tenido la Just to shoot towards the people. This was a teacher's march because they were protesting for their rights. They wanted to take out some of, uh, of uh, their uh, institutes that say, talk about uh, utilizing uh, teachers and uh, many of their rights, and they wanted to take that out of them. So, yeah, Telesur is one of the media channels that has supported a lot and showed the reality of the coup while it while it was happening and also has been keeping an eye on Honduras. So today Honduras has two of the most dangerous cities as well, being number one San Pedro Sula and um, 
as we can see in number four, our capital city, uh, Tegucigalpa. This is uh, this has happened also during the Juan Orlando and Porfirio Lobos government, which crime and murders have increased. Then also another of the difference, we can see that, uh, for example, in uh, Mel Zelaya, who is the deposed president, 389 new employments were created, while in the actual government, 700,000 people have lost their jobs. So we can see how this also adds up to the violence and crime in Honduras. A little bit to the chronologies of, of the events in Honduras. So the coup d'etat happened in 2009, as well as the creation of the National Front of People Resistance. That same year, uh, we go to elections, not dem democratic elections, but imposed by the oligarchy in Honduras. People did not go to vote to these elections, but still the U.S. and uh, other countries would recognize these as elections. Then the first National Assembly of the Resistance is created in February 2010 because the resistance is basically governed by the National Assembly where people of all the departments assist, participate and decide on which actions should the resistance be taking. Then President Manuel Zelaya in May 2011 returns to our country and immediately becomes the coordinator of the National Front of People Resistance. With his experience in the coup, um, he has totally engaged with the, our movement. What happened was that President Manuel Zelaya, during his uh, a government, he was starting to do more popular reforms in our government. And that's why they, uh, the coup was given against him. So he raised the minimum wage from $150 per month to $300 per month. He joined Petro Caribe so we can have uh, cheaper gasoline in our country. And uh, what striked also, well, he wanted to make also the, the base, the military base in Honduras, he wanted to turn it into an airport. So that also affected many of the U.S. interests in our country. But the, the thing that, that many people was opposing to, what well, the oligarchy in Honduras opposed to, and the very conservative sectors of our country, was to the creation of the National Constituent Assembly to form a new constitution in our country because the actual one was made in the 80s by military men. And just an example, it just mentions the word woman once and it's to, to talk about marriage. So uh, definitely we need a new constitution that includes all sectors of society, indigenous people's rights, women's rights, and uh, other LGBTI rights as well. So the Frente Nacional, the resistance, decides to participate in elections in uh, June 2011 and the Libre Party is officially created in 2012. The Libre Party is our electoral apparatus. It's the way that we, the resistance, plans to get to the government to make real changes in our society. So we present Xiomara Castro de Zelaya, who is the wife of the post president Manuel Zelaya Rosales, as candidate for the Libre Party. She is one strong woman that fought besides us in the streets as well while we were marching while we were organizing she rose up as a leader also and uh, concentrated many of the organizations that were supporting president manuel Zelaya and also had uh, the agreement of the social organizations that existed before so this is another video of it shows a little bit also of uh, the, the movement of the resistance and it shows her also accompanying all the people that that were in the streets. As we can see, it's a mass movement of people on the streets. This is her.
coup, during the six months after the coup, military men were always guarding the marches, were always repressing the marches as well.
So, who is Libre? The composition of Libre. Libre Party is created by all the movements of the National People Resistance Front, including campesinos, students and teacher movements, workers, feminists, businessmen and women, indigenous and Garipuna movements, political organizations from the left, center, and uh, that are against the coup. So, uh, also the composition of Libre is all the people that are not organized because the, res the resistance gathers up all of the organizations but then Libre gathers up more people that just want to go to vote, that are not activists, but that they want to vote for something different. So that is also part of the composition of Libre. And uh, Libre, as its ideology, is uh, its planning for the, uh, for the first proposal is to establish the National Constituent Assembly, as I was telling you, that joins all of the sectors of society and also youth because youth has been uh, put apart of all the political decisions in our country, as well as women. So it, um, the Libre Youth was created as well, and uh, to start organizing more young people, because, well, for starters, our country, 50% of its population is between its 13 and 24 years old. So uh, they have to be included. They have a big representation in our country. Libre is openly has openly spoken that it's a socialist and democratic party. So this is very important as well because it has taken a lot of education to the people. Our media, as well as here in the United States, uh, absolutely um, has put in apart all and has satanized, we say, what is uh, communism, socialism. Uh, our media puts in a very bad position uh, Venezuela government, Cuba government. So this is also has this has also been a process of education to the people. It, ha it is a new vocabulary that our people has learned and taking into consideration that many people in Honduras do not go to school, only like um, less than 50% of people go to primary school and only like 30% go to secondary school. So uh, people understanding what the meaning of socialism and capital of capitalism is, is basically based on experience, knowing that their natural resources are being exploded for the benefit of only a small families in our country and only very little percent of people in our country. So it's basically based on their experience. And to, first of all, we are based on the participation without discrimination of any type, no, no for LGBTI, religious, or women discrimination of any type. We started fighting in the streets and we learned, we learned many things of each other. We are now compañeros and compañeras. So as I told you, we knew each other on the streets. It, it, would, it had not been possible if it was not for the coup. It basically pushed us years you know, ahead in organizing because it, it is not easy to organize different sectors with different interests, but the coup it was uh, something bad that happened to our country, but something good definitely came out of it. Also, we believe in a new economic system in which solidarity is more important than individual success. We know what capitalism means, and we know that it's not the answer for Honduras reality. We believe in socialism, and we believe that with a participative de democracy, we can change everything that affects our development. <laughs> see this is a party that is totally different from the ones that we had before in Honduras which always are just speaking of the same things without any new proposals and Libre is making many proposals towards economy towards health towards education as well in our country and um, so uh, this is one of also a, dif a different economy that is not just going to take our resources away, but it's actually be in solidarity with our people. Also, we are against imperialism and militarization, which is a local expression in our countries and of Latin America. Just to mention, a, the U.S. fund is being has been giving aid this year to our country more than a, like I don't million of millions of dollars of dollars to help military militarize our whole country. 
And what has been happening with this is that we have military men almost in every corner of our cities. And in the rural areas, military men are guarding the big landowner's land. Honduras is militarizing with the excuse to fight drug and to fight crime, but this is not what is happening. We have people has uh, has got killed by military men. And uh, uh, just recently, some indigenous people from the Lenca um, community got killed for defending their land from a dam construction, an illegal dam construction, because these people was not consulted. And uh, this is what they are actually doing in our country, and also just vinculating with that corrupt police that we have, and with gangs, and also helping actually in in um, narco traffic. Also, we had uh, four people killed last year by DEA agents in our country, and they were killed in a very poor rural area in Honduras, and two of them were pregnant women. And the DA has not given any answer about it, nor, um, and they have completely, the US has completely refused to investigate. And we know this because we have a Honduran Solidarity Network here in the States who have been pushing towards their congressmen, pushing towards the US state government to give an answer to these killings, but they have had no answer. So we know that people of the United States are also our compañeros and compañeras because they are also under the menace of their government control by the business and military interest. So we know that the U.S. people can also be in solidarity with us, but that are also repressed by their government. So Free Libre Party is also equity, igualdad. Uh, so we believe that Honduras can overcome its actual situation with the work and solidarity of everyone. Uh, this is a government, this is what we want to create, is a government that is for the people, that works for the people and that is also part of the people. Right now, the Libre Party is the number one of all of the surveys. Surveys made by different sectors of our society, sectors like public institutes, NGOs, and some businessmen as well. Uh, I was just reading today that the Congress, the President of Congress, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who is running for President right now, has been paying Paradigma service in Honduras so he can rise up his position in the service. He is actually in number four, position number four. And what he is doing is creating this because since they are in power right now, they, uh, we are expecting fraud. So if he goes up in if he goes up in the service, then fraud is is not going to be so obvious. But um, it, it was an article that came out today in Rebellion.org. If you want to look out for it, um, so uh, it, Libre Party, as I was saying, we do not have money. We do not receive money from the state to make our campaign. So we are not able to pay anyone, not even to make surveys. These are surveys that are made by other institutions that are willing to know uh, the public opinion in Honduras. So uh, this is very important for us because we, as I was saying, we are expecting fraud. It is it's not going to be easy for the Libre Party to get uh, to power. They, they so qualify for international election observers, will they? Yes, we are. We are. That's what we are actually asking for. Or all international support, international electoral observers in Honduras. We have never had international observers for elections. They they never wanted them. But uh, this time, a Libre Party does want them because we want to protect uh, the vote of the people. So. Uh, yeah, it, there is no guarantee that the uh, the, process, the electoral process is going to be fair, transparent. So that is why we need the electoral observers, international electoral observers. And well, the Honduras Solidarity Network is working hard also to be there. They are sending many delegations right now. Between all their their delegations, they have around 200 people people that are going down to Honduras to make a uh, observations. So the, this Solidarity Network was created in 2009 as well and has been the biggest international support of the resistance.
this is a great move, a moment if you want to join the HSN as well. We have Tani Cole who is part also uh, of uh, the organizations inside the network. We have around 34 organizations in the Honduras Solidarity Network. So these are also another names of the of that you can contact. Uh, we have Alliance for Global Justice and the Task Force on the Americans. These organizations are also sending um, electoral observers then down to Honduras. Because if you want to join us, we are going to be very glad that you can uh, you could go. But if not, we are also asking for you to be very eyes open and uh, and uh, very. Um, willing to hear the news and up to date, make have updates on Honduras. If you wrote your name and your email on the list, we can also send you information of what's happening in Honduras. We just sent around an email a week of the updates of Honduras, and uh, it is very important for us that you keep your ears open to what is going to happen in November 24th, that's the day of the elections in Honduras, because it is uh, for us uh, the day that we can demonstrate to the oligarchy and to these conservative parties that we are a big opposition to what they are doing to our country and that the people are conscious that they are corrupt and that they are taking what is from the people and it is not theirs. So we, this is our, like, we say this is our last hope. This is, uh, the people of Honduras is putting all of their hope and resources towards this election. So uh, thank you for coming and for listening. Uh, this that is very important for us to be heard uh, um, around uh, here in the U.S. especially. So thank you. some announcements as well. Uh, as part of uh, pushing the U.S. government towards the situation in Honduras, stopping military aid and helping through neutrality in the elections, we are doing some lobbying um, here in um, New Mexico. So uh, maybe Sarah is going to tell us more work we can join if you want to go and support us in that work. Yeah, so um, tomorrow we're going to be doing a little bit of lobbying um, of local representatives um, and we're going to meet at 11 at Winning Coffee. So if you want to um, come join us, you can meet there and then head over to the representative's office. Which one? Um, Heinrich and... Both senators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both senators. Mm -hmm. Senator yeah. Heinrich has been really good actually, so that's a thank you visit. Senator, you all, um, we would like to push them a little bit more. We're, we're asking for U.S. neutrality in the elections and um, the respect for the results of the election, especially if the candidate wins if they don't play. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, oh, also, if you have, like, I don't know, any questions that you want Yeah, we can do questions. Yeah. And then I just wanted to announce also an upcoming LAII event, um, October 1st through 3rd. We're going to be having a, a documentary film series called Realidades Indígenas Contemporáneas. Um, and it's going to explore contemporary uh, experiences of indigenous peoples of Latin America. So it's going to be October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd at 4 p.m. Um, here in LAII. Is that in Spanish? Um, the movies will be in Spanish, the films will be in Spanish, um, I don't know if they will have subtitles, I don't know, they, they don't, they don't have subtitles, they're in Spanish. Um, so yeah, I'll open it up uh, for questions and answers for Anna. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Given like that you said there's a, going to be apparent fraud, it's a high possibility, what, in, do you have an institute that is like, <laughs> separate from the government right now that will be handling elections? No. It's the elect Supreme Electoral Tribune, the ones that handle all the electoral process. They are part of the government. What we are doing is that we're trying to have representation in all of the tables around Honduras and, um, and also asking for observers. Yeah, that's the most that we can do. Yes. And what would be the path of action if Libre, if a Partido Libre lost the election? What would be, you know, in that scenario, what would be? If we win, yeah. 
No, if, 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 you, if you leave it a loss, then... Oh, if, if it loses, uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, if it loses, the movement continues. Mm -hmm. It's uh, more organization, uh, more working, hard work. It's going to be harder, probably, but because many people are probably are not going to continue working as hard as they have been now, but we the the... The party continues as well as the Frente of the Resistencia. Um, I know you said Libre is, is number one in the polls right now, but what, what percentage of the population is behind Libre? It's, um, well, the, the population that can vote is around uh, 2 million people, and we are around 8 million in the country. So, uh, yeah, it's. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you like how much people, but we have a lot of organization in all in the whole country, like not just in the main cities. We've um, since it, it's the res the resistance and Libre working together, you know, like a, a whole. Uh, it has taken a lot of effort from the people, and um, these surveys have been made mostly in the capital city and also in San Pedro Sula. In the capital city, it's where most people are going to vote. So we can say it's a big representation. Uh, when you showed this slide where it said uh, the jobs created under Senaja and the ones that were lost after, what what kind of occupations were the ones that were offered, or what what businesses were the ones, or what uh, I don't know what uh, industries lost and gained? Like was it because of nationalization and then it was taken it was reversed? Or? Yes, well, for starters, the uh, national uh, communication uh, uh, industry with uh, the, the, the government of uh, Juan Orlando and Porfirio Lobo, it was privatized, made much smaller, and um, that created a lot of lobbyists as well. Basically, uh, the, lob the losing of jobs was in the public, um, the public sectors because Juan Orlando and Porfirio have been privatizing many of these sectors and also in the ports of Honduras they are privatizing as well so this makes many people to lose their jobs and what and with Celaya these were actually strengthening uh, they, they, they were being strengthened and also many jobs were creating in the education system because many schools were open as well in the rural areas and um, with uh, this government, it, it has just had no following up of, uh, of uh, creating jobs. Just basically, they have focused on privatizing our public systems and um, selling our lands. Because this government created uh, the charter city laws, which basically sells a piece of land in Honduras to another country. And they can just have their laws and their own uh, government practically in that piece of land. This has not yet been established in Honduras. They haven't started any model city, but the law is already passed. Also, uh, they wanted to create a law to sell the natural resources that were not being used. Mm. This is just uh, nonsense because all natural resources have a use, but since their point of view, they do not have a use, some of them, and they wanted to sell them. So that one stopped, that one did not pass because um, it, its president became losing a lot of, uh, uh, of, of um, it began losing even more in the service uh, when this law was trying to be passed. So they stopped it. But basically, yeah, it has been because of uh, the privatizing at the state. I'm oh, sorry, just one quick question. Uh, the, you said that they privatized the courts? What, what, what is the what is the, the exports? That we are yeah we export almost everything in Honduras. It's very very little uh, stays in our country. We export fruits, vegetables, uh, a lot of it to the United States because of the free trade agreement. So uh, affecting of course the small farmers and the small farmers are the ones that actually feed us in Honduras. And if it was not because of them we would not have food. It almost uh, like uh, around 80% of everything that we produce is exported. And we import a lot as well. Yes. yes. Can you talk a little bit about the Marxist feminist collective in your part? Oh, yes. Uh, we started uh, in 2010. Um, we 
started as a small collective and that was basically trying to like how to learn everything that, uh, that there is about feminism and uh, feminist Marxism because there are very, very, very experience of feminism. So we wanted to adopt one that was more towards our reality because uh, talking about eco-feminism or more radical feminists was maybe a little bit too specific for what we are going on through right now. So we started studying feminist Marxist feminists and uh, also started studying a sexual education, how to give sexual education to our communities uh, uh, because we, uh, with um, Porfirio Lobo's government, also sexual education was uh, prohibited in schools. So uh, this, is, this has been a very important issue for us. We are around, right now, in the capital city, we are around uh, 15 women that are working in this and we also have uh, like two other co collectives in other parts of our country and uh, we we start protests as well we uh, work with anything that has to do with uh, sexual education right now uh, we made a very important protest to stop uh, the they wanted to prohibit the emergency pill the pill the day after pill and uh, that was stopped luckily so that's, uh, we're working on issues that affect women and their sexual reproduction rights at the moment. But we want to do a lot more. It's very hard because as I was telling you, we all, all that we do is volunteer work and we find our own resources to do what we can. So sometimes it's very slow steps, but we know that um, it, ha it has to be done. But why can't you get help from Venezuela? Or Costa Rica or it's, uh, it's not easy it's not like you know they're, they're, they're just gonna money give the money out and we really we know like for example as, a, as an organization we're very proud to be self-sustainable although it's very hard sometimes um, we basically don't owe favors to anybody and we follow our own line and uh, what we think is best for Honduras as if we receive money for other countries, we don't want to receive a, a, also line of how we need to do things. Although we do take very important steps in uh, their countries because they have had great advance, Venezuela specifically. So we do take many of their of their influence. You know, we we have a lot of influence from them. But yes, we we are not really taking money, and it's not like they can just give also you know to other countries. Um, for people who might not be able to come tomorrow or you know, who just don't have a lot of time to dedicate to helping out but still want to help out, are there any petitions or you know, sort of other things that people can do that might not be you know, whole day thing? Yes. If you stay in touch with the news in Honduras, you're going to see there are many uh, human rights abuses that sometimes are not so publicly denounced and uh, we need that because if the U.S. government has, uh, you know, it's been supporting a gov uh, our government who is involved in human rights abuses, and they have said that that they are proud of the government in Honduras and that they are doing things right. So it, it is very important for us that it is known here that our government is involved, our actual <coughs> government is involved in human rights abuses. But there's no petition or anything like that. Right now, there's no petition okay. going around, but. Uh, it, probably if uh, you know about it, if you sign in the list, of if, if a petition uh, goes around. Yes. Oh, yeah. And it's something that's a because you're a Spanish speaker. Yeah. 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 If we're Spanish speakers, even some English speakers, it's like when we have urgent actions come from Honduras, like we directly call Honduras like jails where like, members of the resistance are being detained. And all you do is ask, like, why are they being detained? Are they receiving medical attention? How long are they being and like we've done this before where we've like just flooded yes. different um, jails with uh, like phone calls from, from the United States or international calls concerned about like illegal detentions that are happening against members of the, of the resistance movement when someone has disappeared in Honduras and there's like no investigation and someone's killed and there's no investigation and a lot of pressure also on to the Honduran authorities to, to protect the population. Yes. Um, so that's something that comes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> Did, didn't yeah. most of the countries in the world consider this a coup except for the U.S. and a few others? It was so shocking when it happened. It, it was the U.S. hadn't been doing this for quite a while, and then they started up again yeah. early yes. in, in the Obama administration. Yes, many countries of the, of the South, of course, they denounced publicly that it was a coup, and uh, well, you know, it's it's like a, the U.S. Uh, just uh, it's our biggest influence is the U.S. So, in many people, even in Honduras, if the U.S. would say that it was not a coup, they would believe they would believe that. So yeah, that is why it's so important for us that the U.S. actually you know stays neutral and uh, and tells the truth about what's going on. It was a slow process of recognizing the current government of Honduras because they held elections under a coup, right, in the fall of 2009. And like the majority of the countries in the world did not recognize the elections, but the entire European Union did it. And then yeah. Yeah. so the kind of one by one, like pushed out of the OEAOEA. Right, right. And this is, yeah, they were kicked out of the, the Organization of American States. And this is kind of the role the United States has played is like to try to legitimize the government of Honduras and, and help to really push to get Honduras back into the OAS, right? And, and, yeah, and kind of encouraging other countries to recognize the Porfirio, the Porfirio government. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for listening.